What? Yes. Yeah, we have a long break. The next class is the 24th of January. They start a week earlier. They've had their last one already. Divvy it up equally. In the astrology? No, all, all new. It's going to go for years. It never ends. Okay. We may have a little overlap here. And uh, we started reading from the Vedas last time, and then we got to some of the Upanishads, and that's where we left off. Uh, we're still doing creation myths, and this is the last session on it. This is a very curious one. All of them tonight are very curious. We'll never get... We're going to st spend the whole time almost on Indian myths, and we'll never get to extract all of the special things, but that's all right. This is from the, the Satpatha, Ramayana, Ramana. In the beginning, Prajapati existed alone. He reflected, how may I produce progeny? He exhausted himself practicing asceticism, and he generated Agni from his mouth. Since he generated him from his mouth, Agni is therefore an eater of food. And he who knows that Agni is an eater of food becomes an eater of food himself. As he generated him first, Agri, of all the gods, Therefore, he is called Agni, for the name Agni is the same as the name Agri. When he was born, he went forth in front, for they say one who goes in front goes first. This is his Agriness. Prajapati then reflected, I have created from myself a food eater, Agni. But there is no food here other than me, who he would not eat, whom he would not eat. Now the earth was bald at that time. There were no plants nor any trees. And this was in his mind. Then Agni turned toward him with an open mouth, and the greatness went out of the terrified Prajapati. Speech is his own greatness, and speech went out of him. He desired an offering made in himself. He rubbed his hands, and because he rubbed his hands, therefore this and this palm are without hair. Then he obtained an offering of clarified butter or an offering of milk, for both of these are made of milk. This offering did not please him, for it was mixed with hair. He poured it away into the fire saying, Burn this, burn and drink this. From it plants were born, and they are called plants, because what he said, uh, burn and drink this, is osa dahya, and osa dahyas are plants. A second time he rubbed his hands, then he obtained another offering, an offering of clarified butter or an offering of milk for both of these are made of milk. This offering pleased him. He was uncertain whether or not this, whether to offer this offering or not. His own greatness said to him, Offer it. Prajapati realized that his own zva, greatness, had spoken aha to him. And so he said, zva aha as he offered it. Therefore one says Savaha as an offering is made. Then he, the sun, rose up and grew hot, and then he, the wind, became mighty and blue. Then Agni turned away. Prajapati performed the offering, producing progeny, and saved himself from Agni, who was death 
and who is about to devour him. Whoever knows this and offers the Agni Hotra oblation produces progeny just as Prajapati produced progeny. Sounds almost a tongue twister. And this way he saves himself from Agni, death, when he is about to devour him. And whenever one dies and is placed in the fire, he is reborn from the fire, just as he is born from father and mother, for the fire consumes only the body. Okay. We're talking about a very high level of creation here, as far as I understand it. This is a very transcendental type of creation, and we're talking about the same thing that we read from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. We're talking about something that is Word-born. And the whole idea, it's a, it's a most interesting idea, the way it is uh, presented to you. It's almost like a cartoon character. Agni is created and Ad, Agni becomes a mouth. And it's like saying the word produced the mouth in the same way that stamp produces seal and that the creative energy of the divine produced a mouth and that which is a creature is a consumer. Clearly this is a fire and it's a fire from the spiritual point of view. All creation begins with warmth before there is light. And the warmth is always a matter of sacrifice. That is, when the spirit, which is completely free, really doesn't have to create, but does so, there is a sacrifice. And in the struggle between spirit and matter, matter being the congealed ignorance of the absolute in that struggle, warmth and fire is produced. And it's really a, a very interesting, if you look at the open mouth, it's like, it must be like the feeling dentists have. Because you're always looking into a confined space. And I can't think of a better way. Very often, those are the, those two apertures, the open womb, and the open mouth are often considered the uh, vessels of space as symbols. This is a really very beautiful symbol in that way. The whole thing is an attitude. The sacrifice is not so much the thing that he sacrifices. Again, we have this whole idea of that which fills, you might say, the ether of universal space is a milk-like, curd-like substance, and then the light that is precipitate in there, it seems like almost like uh, uh, the light in some Sorol paintings. It seems like thick with light. And uh, that's where I think that the rectified butter uh, symbol comes from again. But the whole thing here is an attitude. There's an attitude of sacrifice. Like he's offering himself to his own creation. And you are responsible for your own creation, especially if you have children. You realize that the creation without the creator or without the parent can't exist on its own. And therefore, the act of creation is not just a one-time delivered. It's like a whole process that you keep giving yourself and giving yourself. And this is why creation is something like music or literature or something that moves and evolves is very much different than creating something like a statue. With a statue, there is more that sense of an object here, here you get the idea of something that goes on and on. Again, we have the whole uh, idea of uh, spinning. 
being the source of creation. Remember we talked last time about the vortices that even in our own creative meditations that we set vortices spinning at various places in our aura and from within they seem like they're multiple, multiple dimensional, like they're pointing in different directions, in directions that we don't even know of with our normal compass consciousness. But the whole act of spinning represents the intensity and the depth of focus of concentration. The deeper one concentrates, the more finely to a point uh, the concentration is brought, brought and the more the spinning takes place and the more things are condensed. Uh, we said last time that for God creation is all out, that the great spirit puts everything it has into it. And you can see that the depth of materialization such as we're in now when we're living in a world that is completely matter such that we don't even recognize the spirit that lives within it represents within divinity an enormous, enormous degree of concentration to take things from the rarefied, very rarefied spiritual worlds and condense them down to a point where we can see only the external surfaces of things which has a very illusory nature which we're going to uh, uh, which we're going to uh, talk about more during the night. Again the first thing after the warmth comes the light. Uh, the first sacrifice is a light that is given. I like the statement or the phrase Prajapati realized that his own greatness had spoken to him. A beautiful uh, beautiful statement because intuition you know there's the famous line by Robert Frost where he says if there are no surprises for the poet there are no surprises for the reader. And the same thing holds true in the creation and the continuous creation of the divine. As much as it is pre-pondered and pre-imagined as it comes into existence, it still is a surprise. And the intuition that comes to Prajapati is from his own greatness speaking in him. It's very much like Beethoven says that in every act of creation there is something that goes beyond the creator, meaning to say that there's something above that. And there's always a reticence. You know, it's almost like sending a child out into the world. There's always a reticence. Should I actually do this? Is it profaning it to materialize this creation? And in his greatness, he, he decides to do that and he speaks it out because you know, it's the same thing as the Hamlet statement, to be or not to be. Okay, I guess that's about as I got other notes here, but uh, that's about as far as I want to go on with that one because we've got an awful lot to cover tonight. I don't want to stay too long on it all. Oh boy, here we come to uh, a uh, another unpronounceable. Oh, I'll give it a try. Uh, it's from the Brad Ayanka Brahadayanka Upanishad. In the beginning, this universe was soul. Atman, in the form of man, with a capital M, Purusra. He looked around and saw nothing other than himself. Then at first he said, I am, and thus the word I was born. Therefore, even now, when one is addressed, he first says, It is I and then speaks whatever other name he has, since he, 
preceding Purva, all this universe burnt up, us all evils. He is the man, Purusra. He who knows this burns up anyone who would precede him. He was afraid. Therefore, one who is all alone is afraid. He reflected, since there is nothing other than me, of what am I afraid? Then his fear vanished, for of what could he have been afraid? One becomes afraid of a second. He did not rejoice. Therefore, one who is all alone does not rejoice. He desired a second. He was of the same size as a man and a, man and a woman closely embracing. He caused himself to fall, pot, into two pieces, and from him a husband and a wife, Pati and Patni, were born. Therefore, Yaj Nang Kalya, yeah, <laughs> I'd boggle myself on these. Yajnavalkya has said, oneself is like a half fragment. Therefore, this space was filled by a woman. He united with her, and from this mankind was born. She reflected, how can he unite with me after engendering me from himself? For shame, I will conceal myself. She became a cow. He became a bull and united with her. And from this all cattle were born. She became a mare. He became a stallion. She became a female ass. He became a male ass and united with her. And from this all hooved animals were born. She became a she-goat. He became a billy-goat. He became a you, he became a ram and united with her, and from all this from this all sheep and goats were born, and thus he created all the pairs, even down to the ants. He knew that he was creation, for he created all of us. Thus creation arose. Whoever knows this is born in that creation of his. Then he churned from his mouth as a fire hole, Yoni, and from his hands he created fire. Therefore both hands, mouth and hands, are without hair on the inside, for the fire hole is without hair on the inside. When people speak of him saying, Sacrifice to this God, sacrifice to this God, speaking of one single God and then of another single God, it is his own creation, and he himself is all the gods. Now whatever is moist, he created from semen, and that is Soma. All this universe is food and the eater of food, for Soma is food and Agni is the eater of food. This was the surpassing creation of Brahma, for he created the gods who were better than him, when he, being mortal, created immortals. Therefore, it was a surpassing creation. Whoever knows this is born in that surpassing creation of his. Very, very interesting the way it's so deliberately self-conscious. Whoever knows this is like saying you're responsible for what you know. And it calls your attention back to this that it's supposed to live in you and it's supposed to come to life in you. Having had only a very few creative experiences in life, I can say that the experience, they stand out so much. When you have only a few of them, I don't know what it must be like to have creative experiences all day, every day, but you note things in them. I usually get excited and blow up. I have a creative experience, and rather than 
staying calm in the experience. I get excited and then I lose it all. But uh, having had successive creative experiences on similar themes, I've come to notice certain things about them. Not only do you create something, but you know yourself as a creator. I think it's impossible to have a creative thought or a creative experience and not to come to know yourself in the process. It's like you give birth to two things at the same time, what you're creating and yourself. It's interesting to note here that uh, it discusses loneliness. He was lonely. And he was lonely and afraid. I would rather use the word it than he. It was lonely and afraid. And I think that is one of the things that comes from self-differentiation. One realizes that there is an awful lot that is not self. And that is potential. And I think uh, very often we create out of a feeling of inadequacy or out of a feeling of insecurity. It's like one creative experience, one state of self-conscious knowledge lights up a light that shows that there's even a greater sphere of darkness subtending the one that you are existing in. And this leads to a greater, you could say, fear. And that leads to a greater creative urge. So I think that's that's really very true. Uh, I think everybody who creates is lonely. This is the other side. Remember last time when we were talking about creative principles that are involved in myths and that are involved in creative acts, we said that one must rely completely on what is within in the act of creation. And that's a very singular act, that you're drawing on something that is uniquely yourself. I think eventually one gets to the point, you know, like you can create with other human beings and intuitively have the hits of discovery and creation at the same moment together. But for the beginning, and especially in the beginning of beginnings, one is alone. And uh, I think the creative life is a very lonely life. I must say that the uh, most creative periods in my life have been the most lonely periods. It's almost like the you put yourself in, in insecurity, you draw on something within yourself, or as the previous myth says, the greatness within, and then you create. But that distinguishes you even more from others. And in that distinguishment and separation, you're set apart and you're even more lonely. And uh, I don't know if you've... I've I've, uh, studied a lot of... uh, Herman Hess, I think I read almost everything he wrote. It's not terribly deep, but there are some lovely thoughts in there. And there's one uh, novel that talks about the creative process from two points of view. It's called Narcissus and Goldman. And in there, there is a statement from both points of view about the loneliness in creation. It's very lovely. I think it was really great. The... Uh, other thing is, you know, this is really, I don't know how you can say it. We just read something like five or six paragraphs here. And they were all very simple little stories. But if you take it into account, there are profound psychological things in these relating to the whole psychology of creativity. It's, it, this is really very heavy duty. This again comes to the positive side. The whole idea 
that one needs someone to share with. I can't imagine writing something or painting something and not sharing it. I can't, I can't think of it for any other reason but to share. And I was very fortunate in, uh, in this, this psychological principle that is in this myth. I was very fortunate that it was uh, a large part of my upbringing that we were very big on uh, sharing of experiences in our family. That if there was something on the radio or later on on television that was really entertaining, it was almost like the family rule that you couldn't listen to it alone or you couldn't watch it alone. That if it was really that good, you had to run and get somebody else, even if you missed part of it in the process, because you couldn't, uh, you know, because the whole joy is in the sharing. And I think even though this takes a rather uh, revolved and a rather almost bestial uh, descriptive quality, the sharing of the love and the sharing of the creative act, which is really interesting because it's the female that harbors the uh, suspicion of the incest. And the female in this case represents the receptive matter rather than the projective spirit. You recognize that man in this sense is, does not mean man as a male human being. It represents the cosmic masculine, the projective, willful creative force, whereas the feminine comes out of the other side, the other pole, and it becomes receptive and identifies with the unknown, and therefore there would be that feeling of ignorance or of abhorrence coming from the uh, cosmic feminine, from the imagination. It's like saying that the form is necessary to create, but the form by itself does not hold the truth, whereas the projected truth that uh, directs the imagination or that informs the imagination is, uh, is the... Uh, truth that can stand alone, but it really can't because it has to share. Out of this union, all of the ones are born, meaning all of the uh, thirds, all of the children come out of that. It's an internal kind of giving that uh, the being becomes different things, and from that metamorphosis, things are left behind. It discusses this really very clearly. It goes back after it goes through the rather crude section about uh, uh, cosmic generation uh, in a sexual way, but it then goes back to the dualities. It goes back to uh, spirit and matter, the consumer and the consumed, the materialization and decadence. It's like saying, and this is a really big truth in terms of spiritual evolution, the cosmology that we belong to, we actually create things to destroy them. That's why it's a very important thing in a little child's life to be able to build something up and then smash it all down. Because they recognize, you know, if, if a parent at that stage in life, when a child is building a little block, a house of blocks, and then knocking it down. And if the parent tries to stop the child from doing the destructive part of it, they're doing that child a very great disservice. Because even our bodies, which are our greatest creation, they represent the sum total of our ability to manifest our cosmic intelligence and to manifest reality. Even our bodies are made to resist us and to be broken down because the uh, because the uh, soul material that comes out of them is a consequence of the struggle of the fire that burns in them. Soma being soul, uh, the soma being the essence that comes out of the matter, and so it's really uh, it's uh, uh, it's 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 a very profound creative formula.
Yeah, I'm just astounded that so, but somebody can say so much in one little story that has, you know, we're, we're just, again, glossing the surface because there is more, always more in these things that we could draw out. One more thing is a notion that is mentioned in the last sentence, or just the second last sentence. This was the surpassing creation of Brahm, for he created the gods who were better than him when he being mortal, and I translate that or interpret that to mean being fearful, created immortals. There's something about the creation that surpasses the creator. It's like saying, this is a, another principle of uh, all spiritual meditation and all spiritual creativity. All meditative work leads to transcendence. Even the simple thing is observation. If you observe really clearly, you can't help but to become keenly aware of what you are observing and of yourself as the observer. Yes. Well, they both, but they both came from the same. I think it's the activity in the process. I think it has something to do with the playing make-believe or keeps. In that if he had hesitated and had not created as his original thought was in the preceding myth, uh, he never would have become greater. There's something that in the process of producing a creation and struggling with it, you transcend even yourself. And so, like, it's a continuous, ongoing process. And not only do the creations become better and better, but it's like the creative spirit goes from glory to transcending glory to transcending glory. And it's like... uh in the same way that this thing inverted in the form of masturbation is probably the most fruitless of all activities, because it always involves em empty fantasy. In this way, creation is just the opposite. It is auto-generating, but because it is given for real and there's total sacrifice in it, it's perpetually... Uh, self-fulfilling. All right, we're taking way too long and we'll be here all night again. We've been following these pretty much in the course of the history uh, of the Hindu religion. And now we're going to read from the Mahabharat, a uh, creative myth from the Mahabharat. And previously, we have seen that with the Upanishads and the Brahmanas relative to the Vedas, that they represented giving different viewpoints. They left the, see, the whole idea of commentaries is that you allow the original to stay as the original. And then you can make the commentaries and then they become a work unto themselves without ever tarnishing the original. That's a really beautiful concept. Plus, it allows things to elaborate, and it allows you to give deviations on a theme, and uh, it becomes a very rich thing. And the Hindu society, probably more than any other society, uh, probably not as long as the Chinese society, going back in history, but it has a richness and a copiousness and a continuity of scriptural development. But there are negative sides to it also. As the corpus becomes larger, it becomes more complicated. And if one studies only the commentaries instead of the original material, one can get off in a corner and then one can get involved in all sorts of contradiction, losing that unity that comes from the original creative types of consciousness. 
plus this great weight of material, probably a good library should have one book. I don't care what it is. It should have one book because the bigger your library becomes, the more self-important you become. <laughs> There's a weight of authority from having this whole body. And I don't know who has been the greater abusers of, astro of authority, whether it's been astrologers, but most likely it's probably been priests or doctors. And at one time they were both the same thing. They really had a monopoly. And so what happens with these long-standing traditions are power becomes ingrained in the people who study them. And they have great power in, in India. Uh, the priests, it's not so much now, but the priests have had stupendous power over the people and have not always used it to the best. And when it's that kind of protective power, all sorts of prejudices come in. Now things have developed far enough so that when we read from the Mahabharata, we run into all sorts of prejudices. I'm going to read a piece and then skip and then read another piece. And when I say prejudices, you know prejudices. I will tell you, my son, how Brahma created wanton women and for what purpose. For there is nothing more evil than women. A wanton woman is a blazing flame. She is the illusion born of Maya. She is the sharp edge of the razor. She is poison, a serpent, and death all in one. <laughs> what a proclamation! <laughs> I read these things, I just get jolted out of my seat. This, this is what comes of a, uh, uh, of people who have all sorts of incest fears because they, in eschewing materialism, project themselves into it much more deeply and then they have the great self-hatred which they manifest on the object of the so-called primal incest. These creatures were full of dharma, so we have heard, and since they would become gods by themselves, the gods became alarmed. These creatures mean the first humans. The gods went to Brahma, the grandfather, and informed him of what was on their minds. And they stood silent before him with downcast faces. The Lord Grandfather, learning what was in the hearts of the gods, created women by a magic ritual in order to delude mankind. Now the women of former creation had been virtuous, but these sinful sorceresses arose out of the creation performed by Prajapati, for the grandfather gave them all the desires that can be desired, and those wanton women lusting for sensual pleasures began to stir men up. Then the Lord of Gods, the Lord created anger as the assistant of desire, and all the creatures falling into the power of desire and anger began to be attached to women. Reading further on, at the time of creation, the grandfather, full of fiery energy, created living beings. These creatures increased in age and number to excess, but they did not die again. Then there was no space anywhere between creatures. There was no space to breathe. So congested was the triple universe. He began to worry how he could destroy them. But though he kept thinking, he could not find a means of accomplishing his destruction. He became angry, and from all the apertures of his body, a fire shot forth. And with that, the great-grandfather burned all the regions of the sky. The fire born of the Lord's anger burned heaven and earth and the air, all the universe that moves or is still. All creatures moving and still were burned by the great blast of anger when the grandfather became angry. Then Rudra, the pillar, the Lord of Vedic sacrifices, the God who destroys the power of his enemies, 
the god with pawnee mat, pawnee matted locks, spoke to Brahma about succor and refuge. When the pillar had come there because of his desire for the welfare of all creatures, Brahma, the god who grants boons, seemed to flare off as he said to Shiva or Shiv. You gotta be careful here because they have many names. We've already seen Prajapati and Brahm used interchangeably. Now we see uh, Rudra and Shiv used interchangeably. What wish shall I grant for you today? For you are worthy of a boon from me, and I will do whatever you choose, whatever is in your heart. Sambu. Now he gives him another name. <laughs> this is the fourth one now, because the pillar said... <laughs> Uh, this is complicated to read in original form. Very complicated. Know that I am concerned about the creation of living beings. You have created these creatures. Do not be angry with them, Grandfather. Creatures everywhere are being burnt by the fire of your energy. And when I see them, I am full of pity. Do not be angry with them, O God, Lord of the Universe. I am not angry, said Prajapati, nor is it my wish that living creatures should cease to exist. But in order to lighten the earth, I have sought this destruction. The goddess earth, oppressed by the burden, has kept urging me to destroy them, for she is sinking into the waters under the burden, great God. Though I produced for a long time, I was unable to think of a way of destroying these beings, that kept increasing. Then anger entered me. The pillar said, Have mercy, forbear this final destruction. O Lord, the thirty-three gods do not of, of the thirty-three gods do not be angry. Do not destroy creatures moving and still. All the ponds and grasses, the fourfold community of creatures moving and still, the universe has been reduced to ashes and flooded over. Have mercy, kind Lord. This is the boon that I have chosen. Once destroyed, these creatures will never return again in any way. Therefore, let this fiery energy be absorbed by your own energy. Through your desire for the welfare of all creatures, find some other means so that all of these living beings may return, O heater of enemies. I like the descriptions. Ah, beautiful stuff. I could read the same thing, the same stories over every night for probably for the rest of my life and get something different out of them and a greater appreciation each time. If creatures cease to exist now, they will be cut off from any descendants. Ah, oh, so beautiful. They will be disallowed the privilege of continuing the creation. You have appointed me to be the presiding deity over people here. O oh Lord, Lord of the universe, for all of this universe moving and still, is born of you. If I have pleased you, great God, I beg that all creatures be subject to repetitions of birth and death. When the god Brahma heard the speech of the pillar, he controlled his words in his heart and drew his own energy back within himself. Suppressing the fire, the blessed Lord, who is worshipped by all people, fashioned periodic activity and quiescence. But as the noble Brahma suppressed the fire born of his anger from all the apertures of his body, a dark woman appeared wearing red garments with red eyes and red palms and soles adorned with divine earrings and ornaments. Femme fatale, that she is. She came forth from the apertures. She went to Brahma's right and the two gods, lord of everything, looked at the maiden. Then the god, the first, the lord of the people, summoned her and said, Death kill these creatures. I thought of you when I was angrily devising a means of destruction. Therefore destroy all creatures, imbeciles and scholars. In your passionate anger destroy creatures without exception, and by my command you will win great merit. Then the young goddess Death began to sorrow. Wearing garlands of lotuses, she wept copious tears, which she took in her hands as she prayed for the sake of the welfare of mankind. Wide-eyed, fragile woman, suppressing her extreme grief, joined her palms 
and bent like a vine, saying, How could you, the foremost of speakers, have created a woman like me, carry out such a hideous task, defying all creatures that breathe? I am afraid of violating Dharma. Appoint for me some task in keeping with Dharma. Look for me, look upon me with compassionate gaze. O Lord, I am so frightened I cannot carry off guiltless children and old men and those in their prime creatures who breathe, O Lord, of those who breathe. I beg you, have mercy on me. The beloved friends, brothers, mothers, fathers, the dead will think evil of me, O God, and I fear the dead whom they mourn. The moisture of your pitiable tears will scorch me for eternal years. I am terribly afraid of them, and I seek refuge with you. Those who have committed sins go at the end to the house of Yama. Have mercy on me, O God, Lord giver of boons, show me your grace. This is the boon that I wish of you, Grandfather, of all people, Lord of God, by your grace I wish to practice asceticism. Now we're going to see the other side of asceticism. This is a little long, and sorry about that, but uh, it's brief compared to the original. The grandfather said, Death, I fashioned you in order to destroy creatures. Go and destroy all creatures and do not delay. This must be inevitably and cannot be otherwise. Sinless one with faultless limbs, do as I have told you. When death heard this, she did not utter a Again and again he spoke to the angry woman, but she remained silent as if robbed of the life force. Then the God of Lord, God of Gods, Lord of Lords, Brahma himself, dying to be gratified. Smiling, the Lord of people looked down upon all people, and the anger of the Lord, who was conquered by no enemy, thus became calm, and the maiden went away from him, so we have heard. Death slipped away without having promised to destroy creatures. She hastened to Danuka. There the, pra- there the goddess practiced a supreme asceticism that is hard to practice. For 15,000 million years, she stood on one foot. As she was practicing this most difficult asceticism there, Brahma, whose energy was great, spoke to her again, Death, obey my command. But she disregarded him and immediately began to practice asceticism on one foot for another 20,000 million years. And then, yet another 10 million million years, she dwelt with the wild animals. Then for 20,000 years she ate nothing but air. And for another 8,000 she stood in complete silence in water. Then the maiden went down to Kalsiki River, and there she undertook another act of asceticism, living upon only air and water. Then the Blessed One went to the Ganges, then to Mount Meru, where she stood all alone, as immovable as a piece of wood, for she wished the welfare of all beings. Then on a summit of Himalaya, where the gods performed their sacrifice, she stood on one big toe for another thousand million years. And by this effort, she satisfied the Grandfather. Then he who is the creation and destruction of all people said to her, My daughter, what is happening here? Do as I have told you. But death replied to the Lord, the grandfather, I will not carry off creatures. Again I beg you to have mercy, O God. And she begged him again, terrified of the danger of a dharma. The God of God rebuking her, saying, Righteous death, you will commit no act of a dharma. Subdue these creatures. My words, kind lady, can never fail to come true. Eternal Dharma will enter you for this, and I and the gods will constant will act constantly for your welfare, and I will grant you this other wish which you desire in your heart. Creatures afflicted by disease will not blame you. Among men you will have the form of a man, among women you will have the form of a woman, and among eunuchs a eunuch. And when she, <laughs> they cover all bases. I don't know. It's, 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 it's humorous as well as full of everything else. When she heard this, she placed her palms together and said again to the noble, unperishing Lord of Gods, No. Then the God said to her, Death, destroy mankind. There will be no Adharma in you, righteous one. I promise these teardrops, which I, which I saw fall 
and which you held in your hands will become terrible diseases which will afflict mankind when the appointed time has come. When the time has come for the end of all creatures that bleed, you death will employ desire and anger together. Thus immeasurable dharma will come to you, and you will not incur a dharma for your action will be impartial. Thus you will protect dharma properly as commanded, and you will not cause yourself to sink into a dharma. Therefore welcome this desire. Let the two of you join together and destroy creatures here. Though she was afraid of being known by the name of death, she was so frightened of the curse that she agreed to what he asked. Then she began to, draw, to destroy life's breath of creatures that breathe at the end of their time, bewildering them with desire and anger. And the two drops falling from death became diseases which injured the bodies of men. Thus death created, was created by God. When the appointed time has come, she destroys creatures as is proper. And the tears she shed are the diseases which cause creatures when which destroy creatures when the proper time has come. It's a big mouthful. And I've got notes probably to uh, um, last for several nights. I might just stop abruptly in here because there are a whole bunch of other notes to cover yet. But somewhere in here I'll stop because enough is enough is enough. Again, we have this scheme where the feminine and death and matter are all associated again. We note in here that there had to be a fall because we note that the creatures are weighing the earth down and it's falling. Now there's a fallacy in this. This is a very tricky myth to read, at least as I understand it. There's never any danger of inner space becoming too full. If we could see everything that interpenetrates the area of this room, all the beings that are in it, we would be astounded because there are beings within beings and within beings and there is intelligence within intelligence. It's like a poem that never quits. There's meaning after meaning after meaning you can get out of it. And so this, there is a ruse in here. It's saying that death was created and there was this terrible destruction by fire because uh, space was getting too full. That's not the case. This is a myth that was developed by people who were still coming into matter. This is at a, this is a still a very early myth. All of this myth associates matter with Maya as illusion, as in a noun sense, as a thing of illusion. And there was great reticence to enter into matter for fear of the possibility of losing the power of what is called in these verses asceticism. And therefore, this, you see the, the fall here is very different than the fall is in the Kabbalah. In the Bible, when we read about the fall, the fall was caused by too great of an eagerness for sex. And this too great of an eagerness for sex projected a sex means creation, projected people into matter. Here, the same effect is described with a different point of view. It was a reticence to enter into matter that caused the fall to take place. A myth or two down the way, we're going to see more of this. But it's 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 a totally different uh, it's a it's a it's a totally different point of view. Uh, we note in here destructions by fire and water, which are the same in all myths. 
and we know it in here. It's really interesting. If you study all mythologies, you know that there are 33 uh, generations to the body of Jesus, and there were 33 myths to the Freemasons, uh, for 33 uh, steps in Freemasonry. And here now, the gods that surround Rajapati or Brahm are 33. It's, it's really interesting the way uh, uh, it would be nice to do some more comparative mythology. Oh boy, I don't know how much I want to go into here. I should need to put some lighter subjects because I got all kinds of lights here. Interesting that death is pictured as being red. And that's even uh, Yama, who rules the kingdom of the dead, is projected as being red. And Mars, the slayer in the West, is projected as being red. But do you know what color in the aura is associated with the cause of death? Hmm. Like a lustful sensual sexuality is something like uh, a dirty olive green uh, an olive drab it's like army clothes and it brings out the point that death here is a redeemer complementary colors fulfill opposite positions they do opposite things what something is outward is its abundance. That is, you know, like if something is blue on the outside, in, it, it, it has an abundance of, of blueness. But what, it, what its inner side is or what its complement is, is the opposite color. And the types of desire that do the crystallization that produce the fall are reactivated by red again. The red is, is, is again the color of activity. And so what I'm trying to talk about is that the polarities here are taken in color as well as in abstract concept. And when some, this is again that whole idea of form needing to be revivified. And it comes back really, really quite beautifully. Oh boy. Number of other things that are really I don't know that I want to talk that much about the fall of man because that gets to be a really long, long thing. Should we talk a little bit about Dharma? The concept of Dharma is the concept of the closest work word that I can understand in the English language is spiritual purpose. It is to say that the great creation, it has a form and it has uh, a plan and everything goes according to the scheme, but behind all of that is purpose. And that is called God. And one's actions, which are called harm, in order to be fruitful, have to be in harmony with purpose and have to be filled with purpose. And one can see that what is being suggested at here, all of this asceticism, before doing an act like destroying something, is personally, one has to be filled with great purpose in order to do that. See, the whole notion of the fall is that it is a fall in purposeful living. In both cases, in the Western conception of the fall and in the Eastern conception of the fall, in both cases, ignorance sets in. And when ignorance sets in, one can do purposeless acts, wanting acts acts that are to no end. And so 
the death, what this is saying over again and again, is saying that death and being burned up in the fire of death again and being brought back to that lively red hot state is a reunification with purpose after having gone too deeply into the matter. It's very interesting to note that the first two sins uh, in the uh, Vedic tradition out of which this derives and the first two sins in the Kabbalistic uh, tradition out of which our Bible uh, derives are identical. The first sin is a sensual, materialistic, selfish, sexual desire. And the second sin that comes out of that selfish desire is anger. Because that once you have desire and that desire brings you over densely into matter, you're going to be frustrated. And when, you, when you're frustrated, you're going to be angry. And so like the, the first sin was the disobedience of Adam and Eve eating the fruit, that is the fruit of sexual creativity. And the second sin was the sin of Cain and Abel, uh, Cain slaying Abel out of anger. So like the, the, the stories each give a different point of view, but all of the myths are basically telling the same kind of stories. I think that's about as much as I want to say. I like the whole notion that uh, death is seen as a uh, as a neutral thing, and you know, death is not the same thing as pain and agony. Pain and agony is what death is a cure of. And pain and agony are the uh, uh, consequences of desireful living, or what this would say, a dharmic living, when you're living without purpose to uh, selfish end, uh, pain and sorrow is going to be the consequence. And the relief of that coming back into the light and into the fire is, the, uh, is, is what uh, death is all about. Other creation myths, when it talks about this terrible fire where the divine is burning up all of the creation, all the creatures are dying, other myths tell that another way. It says like the creatures, in order to exist independently and to be able to create on their own, had to be far enough removed from the creative fire of the divine so that they could do their own thing without being over you'd be able to think eclipsed all the time by the greater creation. And uh, so like what is described here is a terrible scourge, the wrath of, uh, of the divine destroying everything. That's, that's one way that it, it could look at it really, you know, that's, that's just a statement of how it is, you know. That's the same thing as Harry Truman saying, uh, if it's too hot in the kitchen, get out. <laughs> you know? Uh, don't cook if it gets too hot in the kitchen. Yeah, that's that's what the statement is. Good. All right. Uh, let's read a little bit from the uh, Vishnu Purana. Oh, these are a little bit longish, but uh, they're uh, they're from the Vishnu and Vayu Puranas. I don't know how many of these I want to do. How about this? Is this getting uh, too laborious? Yeah, but uh, everybody doesn't have access to all the myths. That's that's the problem with it. Starts. This one starts off very heavy. And this is when the uh, myths have again become uh, redeemed. Sort of like the Mahabharata is a low point uh, for opinionation. There's a lot more uh, philosophical redemption in this. Although all creatures, uh, although all creatures are destroyed at each cosmic dissolution, they are not released from rebirth, but are born according to the reputation of their former good or bad, former good or bad karma. Therefore, when Brahma performs creation mentally, from him are born the fourfold teachers 
varying from gods to inanimate objects. When Brahma desired to create the four types of waters, gods, demons, ancestors, and men, he harnessed the forces within his own self. He was, the, he was thus concentrated, desiring to create the quality of darkness, became manifest in Prajapati. The first, the demons were born from his thigh. Brahma then aban abandoned his own body, which had the quality of darkness, and that body which he had abandoned became night. Still desiring to create, he took another body and found pleasure. Then the gods in whom the quality of goodness was predominant were born from the mouth of Brahma. He abandoned that body too, and it became the day in which the quality of goodness is paramount. Therefore at night the demons are powerful, and by day the gods. Then he took another body in which the quality of goodness formed the essence. And as he thought of himself as being like a father, the ancestors, the putras, fathers, were born from him. The Lord then abandoned that body when he had created the ancestors, and that cast-off body became an evening twilight, which stands between day and night. Then he took another body in which the quality of passion was the essence, and from him was born the body of men in whom the quality of passion abounds. Prajapati quickly abandoned that body too, and it became the light of early twilight, the dawn. Therefore, when this light arrives, men are powerful, and the ancestors become powerful at the time of evening twilight. Now, all this is factually true in terms of, uh, of clairvoyance. Uh, it's, uh, it's just really, really amazing. The light of dawn, night, day and evening twilight, these are the four bodies of the Lord Brahma which served as vessels for the three qualities. Then he took another body in which the quality of passion was the essence and from Brahma hunger was born. And with hunger, anger was born. Then the Lord created in darkness beings that were emaciated with hungry, deformed, bearded beings, uh, bearded, and they ran to the Lord, those who said, no, not like that, protect him. And they became laksasas. And others who said, let us eat. And they became, became yaksas because of eating. When the creator looked upon them with displeasure, the hairs fell from his head and grew upon his head again. They became snakes called serpents, sarpa, because they had glided down, and snakes, ahi, because they had departed him. No. Then the creator of the universe became angry, and he created creatures who had anger as their essence because of their tawny color. These fierce ones are eaters of flesh. Then the Gandharvas were born from his body as he sang. They are drinkers of speech and are therefore called Gandharvas. The Lord Brahma, having created these creatures when he was impelled, when he was impelled by their own capabilities and powers, then created others of his own will. He made the birds from his own youthful energy. He made sheep from his breast, goats from his mouth. Prajapati created cows from his stomach and his two sides. From his feet he made horses, elephants, donkeys, oxen, deer, camels, mules, antelopes, and the other species. Grasses, fruits, and roots were born from the hairs of his body. Thus the Lord Brahma, first creator and Lord created, and whatever karma they had achieved in former creation, they thus received this karma as they were again created again and again, harmful or benign, gentle or cruel, full of dharma or a dharma. I think I'll just break off there. The Lord creator himself diversified the variety and differentiations of all the objects of the senses and properties. By the authority of the Vedas, he fashioned the very beginning, the name, the form of the creatures, gods, and other, others, the diversity of their functions and appellations of the sages of the Vedas. Uh, there's nothing great in, important after that.
this one has something that I've seen, that I've pondered for a long, long time that I don't understand. And maybe all of you thinking on it will put something into the ethos. This conception at the very beginning of the myth that all beings, humans like us, other creatures, if the whole cosmos were to dissolve now and go into a state of non-being, where there are no connections of any kind, there's non-being. But yet, when being springs to life at the next creation, everything picks up where it left off. This raises great difficulties for me. It's in a lot of different uh, spiritual outlooks. It's in a lot of different mythologies. But how is there a continuity of action through a state of complete inaction? I don't understand that. It almost leads one to believe that action itself is an illusion, a passing of consciousness over a spiritual potential. You know what I'm trying to say? That everything is static. The only thing that seems, the only thing that seems to make things move or change or have action, which is karma, is a mental action. If this is, this whole myth is very clear about distinguishing the difference between creations that are mental creations, that are completely in the spiritual consciousness and in the forms that come out of them, and then finally forms that are born out of direct acts of will, and then later on forms that are capable of producing their own creation. Uh, this, this is... Uh, this is a, a very good notion of creation. I think it's a very deep and profound showing that in that state which the various myths have called darkness, that in that darkness where there is warmth, there is a sacrifice of thinking. I've come to realize now that the old admonition that is given to all mystical aspirants that the way to spiritual growth and salvation is by work and by prayer, well, the two are actually the same thing. Because prayer is the highest and most focused kind of thinking, but that thinking is work. And so all everything that we know as a creation, what this seems to be saying is everything that we know as a creation is a product first of dark thinking. Not even a thinking that where there is a manifest form. It is a dark thinking. It's interesting to notice that the demons, which which are really not demons as we think of devils or something like that, in the first uh, stage of creation where the demons are strong in the dark, I think they're talking about elemental creative forms. And they're talking about indistinguished things like in the previous myth where Prajapati said, I am, and I would burn up anything that would before me, that's what's taking place in the darkness. It's warming up the burning. You know what I'm trying to say? That before we can integrate all the things that are in ourself, we have to know ourself. And in the process of knowing ourself, there is a great deal of pondering, of weighing of creative thinking in ourselves in which of ourself in which the components of ourselves seem like demons in the dark. As they become objectified by the warmth, they're almost like patched. Then we come to a creative self consciousness and then we integrate them and then the creation becomes uh, becomes more full. Uh, the state the uh, the statement here, this is not just like taking the four corners of the day. You realize that. If this applies to the four corners of the day, 
but it also applies to the, uh, to the creation itself. Like all seers, when talking about cosmogony, say that the first stage is everything is dark and thoughtful. And then on the second day, there is light. But then the light gets dimmer because the light gets focused more into the material worlds and the qualities that are going along with the diminution of light are greater and greater desire. Again, greater and greater consumption, greater and greater matter, and greater and greater association with the unconscious part of self that is hungry. And if one identifies too greatly with that, then we have the fallen state. So this is really quite a beautiful and elaborate myth, because I like them all. Uh, <laughs> uh, these uh, bodies, you know, this is, we live in successive bodies of the divine. I don't know how to say it any other way. All of those bodies that have been cast off, so to speak, by Prajapati here are actually whole realms. And they are realms, again, this is, this is much more sophisticated in a way than the last one. That in the case of the last, or an earlier one, Prajapati throws off something as a creation and then transcends it. This is much more successive. This has more flavors to it by successively incarnating in bodies of various depths of materialization and throwing them off, the consciousness of the divine follows all of these different stages. Oh boy. I guess uh, one other little topic I'll take up and then what, what are we doing for time? Yeah, it is a bit longish. I've got enough to go on for hours. I, uh, <laughs> how, how's everybody feeling? Would it, people like to go on longer or not? You have, oh, you have, oh, okay. Um, yeah. I, uh, I have, two other selections that I could go into and uh, they're filled with lovely curses that run for paragraphs long that even for Shakespeare to shame. Uh, but uh, this is a bit long. I don't want to continue into another session and so I think we'll probably break uh, right along here at this point, rather than going into anything more, so I might want I want to do read a few lines from what I consider the greatest of all creation myths, and it's written in poetry, which it's in seven stanzas, and it is out of the secret doctrine. It's called the stanzas of Dzyan. Yeah. The stanzas of Dizyan are very, very ancient. In the myth that we've just looked at as a creation myth, it says the creation was done by Brahma according to the Vedas. That the Vedas there don't represent those ancient primitive scripts, scriptures, but the scriptures are meant to be, you know, the, this is a notion that happens with materialization of things. There are people, we run into them every day, that believe that the Bible is the living word of God. It's probably the dead word of God. Uh, the living word of God is what we're living in, and what we're living by. But there is a truth in that. 
there are, going back to the principle of Dharma and purpose, it is possible to pack purpose into words. And there is a great cosmic creative formula. And scriptures like the Vedas, the Puranas, or the Bible are echoes, the resonances of that divine creative formula. They are sort of a shorthand of the divine creative work. And in a way, they represent it. And so when it says, uh, Brahm created by the Vedas, he's talking about, according to the greater scheme, the mythographer who wrote this. And this is probably the best statement. It's very long, and I know it's, it's very hard to sit and listen to someone read. It's a very impatient thing. But I'll read little bits and make comments as I go. But this is so lofty. This is far, far deeper than anything we've looked at so far because it goes into the depths of creation to the very absolute and uh, the supreme of supreme. And uh, the poetic structure is magnificent. The eternal parent, wrapped in her ever invisible robes, had slumbered once again for seven eternities. The woman is the dream. The saying at the depth of the depth is the feminine. Time was not, for it lay asleep in the infinite bosom of duration. The universal mind was not, for there were no ahi to contain it. The seven ways to bliss were not. The great causes of misery were not, for there was no one to produce and get ensnared by them. Darkness alone filled the boundless all, for father, mother, and son were once more one, and the son had not awakened yet for the new year and his pilgrimage thereon. The seven sublime lords and the seven truths had ceased to be, and the universe, the son of necessity, was immersed in Paramishpana to be outbreathed by that which is and yet is not, not was. The causes of existence had been done away with, the visible that was and the invisible that is rested in eternal non-being, the one being. Alone, the one form of existence stretched boundless, infinite, causeless, in dreamless sleep, and life pulsated unconscious in universal space throughout that all presence which is sensed by the open eye of Dhamma. But where was Dhamma when the Alaya of the universe was in Paramartha and the great wheel on Upadaka? That's the first stanza. Poetically and psychologically, it is a masterpiece. Because it opens up an awe and a reverence for the absolute by saying what it is not. It describes all of the things that are by saying they weren't there. And it does in a silhouette fashion something most magnificent. It allows you to look sideways at what is the most wonderful things that are without having to say all of those glorious things about them which are always too little. And it gives even greater reverence, but cautious reverence, 
that which is not, which is greater yet. And the psychology of being able to do that, I don't know how uh, how many of you have clairvoyant-like experiences, but until one learns the right kind of focus, to focus directly on something, you don't see it. You know what I'm saying? That some things like you see like all it seems like you're seeing it out of the corner of your eyes. And if you can learn that indirect attention that you can see things without having to confront them, because in confronting them you don't see. And that is a like a little exercise that it has to do with perception that is something like what one does with the focus of attention in understanding what is and what is not. So the poetry of this is magnificent. The uh, eternal parent, in this case, is seen as feminine. The masculine doesn't appear no hints are given. You know, this is you know, a great poetry. It doesn't introduce it to you all at once. It, you know, it, it gives you hints and allows something to develop in your mind. Uh, last summer, I believe it was, that uh, they did, no, the summer before, they did Oedipus out of American Players. And all of the things that were going to happen you were led up to them. You were told every word and every action and every attitude before they happened. And you would think that when the event came that it would be anticlimactic. But it wasn't. It actually, you know, there are some things like that that can be anticlimactic, like those uh, Boston store ads like, we love you mad. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know what I'm trying to say? It, it develops in that way. Uh, maybe I'll read a few more of the second stanzas. Uh, there are seven stanzas, and they get more and more complex and obscure as they go on. Now, mind you, this is at a level, though some of the different creation myths that we've looked at have hinted at the uh, have hinted at the various different principles. They haven't been put hierarchically and to such a level of depth within as this creation story. Where were the builders, the luminous sons of Montfantaric dawn? In the unknown darkness, in their Ahi Paranishpana, the producers of form for no form, the root of the world, the Deva Matri and Sabavat rested in the bliss of non being. Now here comes some beautiful words. Where was silence? Where the ears to sense it? No, there was neither silence nor sound, not save ceaseless eternal breath which knows itself not. The hour had not yet struck. The ray had not yet flashed into the germ. There's that intuition again on the grandest of all level. The Matra Padra had not yet swollen. Her heart had not yet opened for the one ray to enter, thence to fall as three into four into the lap of Maya. The seven sons were not yet born from the web of life. Darkness alone was father, mother, Sabovat, and Sabovat was in darkness. These two are the germ, and the germ is one. The, germ, the universe was still concealed in the divine thought and the divine bosom. See, this is this gets around the whole question. This is almost I don't know how to say it. This is like. It gets on the whole question of incest, of divine cosmic incest. And this is very much for one who wishes to become a seer. Because 
this is visual at the same time that it is pithy with invisible meaning, and it has the whole quality of it's by speaking in negatives, and you have this mother lotus one open and mother of lotus and the heart being put together, trying to open up and allow the ray to enter, which is the same as for it to be drawn in. It's a magnificent, magnificent poetry. Let me read just a few lines, and then we'll call it a night for tonight. That was stanza two. These are abbreviated stanzas because it's probably volumes to do the whole thing. The last vibration of the seventh eternity thrills through infinitude. The mother swells expanding from within without like the bud of the lotus. The vibration sweeps along, touching with its swift wing the whole universe and the germ that dwelleth in darkness, the darkness that breathes over the slumbering waters of light. Darkness radiates light, and light drops one solitary ray into the mother deep. The ray shoots through the virgin egg. The ray causes the eternal egg to thrill and drop the non-eternal germ, which condenses into the world egg. Then the three fall into the four. The radiant essence becomes seven inside, seven outside. The luminous egg, which in itself is three, curdles and spreads in milk-white curds, white, white curds throughout the depths of the mother, the root that grows in the depths of the ocean of life. The root remains, the light remains, the curds remain, and still Oli Ahahu is one. That's supposed to be the seven vowel word that, if you know how to say it, it's your name and the name of God. There are places in here, some of the names are just left as blanks. The whole idea of germination, you know what I'm trying to say? Though this happens, this has a quality of just happening. It's not so anthropomorphic that it is deliberate, like all of the other myths. There is a sense of wonder. The egg is thrilled. And this is like, this is an action that is more powerful than deliberate. And the feeling of germination, when it says the light remains, you know, everything, it sticks. That's what they say. You know, you've heard it on the farm when they breed cattle. The, and, you know, very often that uh, when, a, when a bull mounts a, a, a heifer, it sometimes it isn't a fertile union. And you say, well, that one looked like it's stuck. And this is this is truly a case of it sticking. I highly recommend uh, the stanzas of Dizian. We're just about to break up for tonight. I rec recommend it as probably the best creation myth that you can find anywhere. But good luck in trying to uh, uh, interpret it because... Maybe only the seventh stanza can really be interpreted because all of what you find in most books of uh, esoteric cosmology start with the seventh stanza. <laughs> Everything that goes before, they sometimes mention it in maybe a paragraph or two, but it's it's too too lofty and too profound. We're going to take a long break now, and when we come back, we're going to do something very different.